Are we okay? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being with us this uh, early afternoon here in beautiful Kyoto, Japan. And welcome all the remote participants that are following from all over the world. For my colleagues in Latin America, it must be extremely late at night, but I'm sure that some of us, some friends of us are there. And thank you, uh, distinguished colleagues and, and dear co-moderator here. My name is Olga Cavalli. I am the National Cybersecurity Director of Argentina, and also I chair the South School of Internet Governance. Here with me is my dear friend Tracy Hawkshaw. He Hello. is now the chef Dante Priest that post from the Universal Post Union Caribbean. He will be helping me in chairing this very interesting session about bridging the gap between international negotiations and on-ground experiences in cybercrime response. And I would like to briefly present my distinguished colleagues and, and friends that who are with us this afternoon, Mr. Christopher Painter. He is director of the GFC, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, but also he is a very well-known expert in, in cybersecurity, cybercrime, and he, has, he was the first uh, um, cyber uh, ambassador or cyber diplomat in the world. And we have online uh, Katitza Rodriguez from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. She is the policy director for global privacy. She's online. Are you there, Katitza? Are yes, we, I'm you here. with us? Oh, Katitza, how are you? How are you, Olga? How are you, dear? She, she's in New York, but she's Peruvian. She's from Latin America. Welcome, Katitza. Yeah. And we have Alisa Stalczak. She is Cloud's first vice president from Global Head of Public Policy. Welcome, Alisa. And over to Tracy, who will present the other distinguished panelists. Thank you very much, Olga. Let me first introduce, um, well, welcome everyone to today's session. I'd like to introduce um, Elizaveta Belyakova. She's a chairperson of the Alliance for the Protection of Children in the Digital Environment. Are you there, Elizaveta? Yes. Hello. She's online. We also have a very special guest with us, Ernesto Rodriguez Hernandez, Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Communications of the Republic of Cuba. Welcome, Honorable um, Deputy Minister. And remote, we have Fulake Olagunyu, Program Officer for Cybersecurity, Internet, and E-Applications at the Economic Community of West African States, who is also remote. Fulake, are you there? I am indeed here. A Welcome. very early good morning to everyone. Hand back over to Olga now to continue you, the program. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you all distinguished panelists who are with us in person or remotely here in Kyoto and remotely. What's the purpose of this session? There are several international activities and forums and United Nations efforts uh, in relation with cybersecurity, cybercrime, like for example, the open-ended working group and uh, um, United Nations ad hoc committee. There are regional uh, initiatives, uh, but how that, uh, those initiatives do uh, impact or do relate with national activities and national regulations, activities of the CSERTs, um, activities of companies trying to uh, build different um, uh, best practices. And uh, is this a real relationship? Is this a real impact of those global activities or uh, intentions to, to have a global policy? with local uh, efforts. Uh, is there a link? There is, there is a link, or could we find ways to enhance uh, a possible link in between these two uh, like kind of a global and, and national and regional activities? So for this, uh, we have prepared some ideas and some questions for our, no, sorry, I have to give the floor to, to Tracy, who will do some other comments, general comments about the session. Sorry for that. That's all right, Olga, thank you. So just to add to what you're saying, I think today we want to look at some best practices, as you were saying, maybe get some case studies out of the group to really understand and get to the, 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 you know, the real meat of the matter. What are the underground experiences that you have, um, whether with your clients, with your stakeholders of cybersecurity um, in your country of policies and potential best practices, preventative measures, and maybe some lessons learned for us. 
So I think that's what we want to deal with today. And I hope that we can really get to the crux of the matter, get some questions from the audience as well. And um, let's deal with the, the real issues. Let's not get into theory. Let's get into the real you know, base issues that, on cybersecurity. Thank you, Tracy. So uh, let, let's start with Christopher. He has a, a vast experience. And now if you talk to him and, and, and he explains to you how many places he will travel in the next month, you will be amazed because he's going to all over the world trying to do a, a very important efforts in relation with capacity building related with cybersecurity. So uh, Christopher, how can international bodies like the United Nations Open Ended Working Group and the Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime, for example, and similar entities effectively incorporate the expertise, insights, and real-world experiences gained from cybersecurity practitioners. Uh, thank you, Olga, and it's great to be here. And I should say that if you're wondering what this I, I'm wearing around my neck, it's uh, uh, when I left the government, the government of Japan was nice enough to give me something called the Order of the Rising Sun. And it's the first time they gave that to someone doing cybersecurity work. So that shows, in a sense, that cybersecurity has matured as more of, a, more of a policy issue, but I also want to express my gratitude to the government of Japan, who I worked very closely with when I was in the government, uh, in terms of uh, cybersecurity and cybercrime issues. And I, and, I, and I have had a long experience as a, uh, a federal prosecutor doing cybercrime before anyone thought it was cool, uh, and then uh, you know at, uh, at the Maine Justice Department, at the FBI, at the White House, and finally at the State Department. And I've also followed these negotiations, both the open-ended working group in New York, I've been sending several of those meetings, and the ad hoc now negotiation on, uh, on, uh, uh, on cybercrime. And of course, those are not the only games in town. There are things that are outside the UN as well. I think that's really an important question. How do you incorporate real on-the-ground experience? Because often the people who negotiate, and I love them dearly, and I was one of them, uh, are diplomats who, uh, you know, now we have more cyber diplomats. There's many countries have people dedicated to this, but they're not necessarily the people who are the practitioners or understand some of the real challenges on the ground. And then the other thing that, that happens, at, uh, particularly at the UN level, it's great because it brings every country in the world together, but it's not built for other stakeholders. It's built for countries. And it's also, you know, just as a natural uh, course of uh, matters, there's a lot of geopolitical aspects. So a lot of the things that happen in those venues are driven by geopolitical issues more than sometimes practical issues. Um, and bringing that expertise, when you're, especially when, say, you're negotiating a cybercrime treaty, it's really important to know how things work, how investigations work, what has worked, what hasn't worked, what are impediments, making sure that you're respecting human rights. So having those experts in the room, I think, is really important, both from government, uh, but also from outside government. And the same with the OAWG on the cybersecurity issues. There is a lot, a wealth of experience and knowledge outside of those rooms normally, and so you need to figure out how to bring them in. So I'd say they've done a pretty good job at reflecting a lot of the things going on, but imperfect. And, and we'll talk more about this later in terms of multi-stakeholder uh, involvement. But you know, I, have, I do think the Cybercrime Treaty is building off the Budapest Convention, it's looking at uh, where that's going to go. I, I can't tell you where that's going to end up right now. There, there are, again, geopolitical differences in terms of scope of this treaty, et cetera. And the open-ended working group, uh, you know, it's, it's good that all these countries are meeting. That wasn't happening before. Every country is seized with this issue. At the same time, it's sometimes it's like listening to paint dry. You're sitting there, and it's like nothing's really happening, and they're not moving very quickly. Um, so, so I do think that there's been activity, there's been movement, there's been more of a political priority of countries on these issues, which is important. But I still think there's a gap between that political level and the practitioner level, which we really need to do everything we can to bring together, because you need both. You need that information. You need to translate between policymakers and people on the ground, whether it's cybercrime or cybersecurity, so that the trade space, you understand that what the trade space is, and the policies you're making reflect reality and also help the people who are trying to protect our networks and also to go after cyber criminals. The one thing I'd say before I, you know, as we wrap up, it's interesting that ransomware and the scourge of ra ransomware over the course of the last few years has really converted this more than ever before into a priority for countries around the world because it's become a pocket bush, a book issue where people have to wait in line for gas or they can't get their health insurance, or they can't get their hamburger, or other kinds of food. That makes it a, not just a pocketbook issue for people, but also in a backyard issue. It makes it a political issue. And so that's raised this more than I've seen before 
And I hope we can sustain that effort because we need sustained attention on this, not just here in this room, which is a great forum and, and the whole IGF to talk about it, but beyond that. Thank you, Christian. I think you, you emphasized the importance of the dialogue in between technicians and non-technicians, government officials and diplomats. We, I consider myself a technician, I'm an engineer, so we have, we have this, uh, this, we should develop this ability of uh, explaining concepts, not, not very technical things, but really conceptual things, so other, other colleagues that are involved in other stakeholders can understand concepts. Once, once you get the concept, sometimes it's easier to... And I think that helps a lot of policymakers who are afraid of this issue because they think it's technical, but they deal with complex issues every day, and you don't have to be a coder to understand the, the key geopolitical and other issues here. Uh, I'm a recovering lawyer, and I can still talk to people, so. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we will follow up with you with other questions in a moment. Uh, I will go now to Katitsa, that she is in New York. Katitsa, are you there? Hi, Katitsa. I'm here. Nice, Hi, to, nice to see you virtually. It's been a while we haven't met. I hope you, to see you somewhere in the future, in person. Uh, Katica, considering the role of the media, how can effective communication about cyber attacks and cyber security risks contribute to bridging the gap between negotiations and practical efforts, fostering public awareness and facilitating informed decision making? The floor is yours. Thank you, Olga. It's nice to hear from you. Hi, everyone. Um, well, first, I will start saying that uh, my work uh, focuses on global privacy topics, including cross-border data exchanges in the context of criminal investigations. And I have been involved for a long time in discussions on cybercrime policy and legislative issues from a civil society perspective. And right now, that focus of the grand part of my job is in the United Nations Cyber Grand Treaty, uh, the negotiation that is currently being held in Vienna or in New York. Um, that's been a large process at the global level involving, as uh, it was said by the previous speaker, by member different member states, states around the world. Over six negotiation sessions and a lot of controversy about the scope of the treaty, even at the basic level of defining what cyber crime is and how cross-border law enforcement and evidence-guided dating assistance should work. Uh, but back to your question, we see in the media security problems everywhere, from data breaches to ransomware infections to botnets. The harms are obvious, and we read it all the time in the media. Cybersecurity must make people more secure, however, uh, against such threats and not less, and should not undermine our privacy and human rights. And we would like to see the media help people better understand the threats landscape and also the importance of a rights-based approach to cybersecurity. To protect a free and open internet from malicious attacks, we need to address the underlying problem. Far too many programs, devices, and systems are woefully insecure. And the process of discovering, disclosing, and patching vulnerabilities is often underfunded and disorganized across the public and private sector at the domestic and international level, at the federal or state level. End users often have little or no awareness of how to protect themselves against such attacks. Media narrative responding to crises like ransomware need to address this whole landscape of vulnerability, and legislators should not just demand expansions of surveillance and law enforcement powers, including across borders. The media can also shed light on the, index, on the key roles of security researchers, digital security trainers, journalists, and others, improving and safeguarding our rights. And many of these professionals are also working inside of technology companies that have made security research a priority. By presenting their stories, challenges, and contributions, the media can humanize the often technical world of cybersecurity. This narrative is essential to contrast with the UN Cybercrime Treaty current stance, which potentially jeopardize this professional's work, the work of security researchers. To address cybersecurity challenges, we need better incentive to make software, devices, and networks secure, better education for users and developers, and better sharing of information about threats, vulnerabilities, and solutions. And we need legal protections for security researchers. 
Unfortunately, high profile efforts like the UN Cybercrime Treaty, which is currently under negotiation, have focused almost exclusively on enhancing law enforcement powers, including across borders, while giving minimal attention to a positive cybersecurity agenda of making systems and networks stronger at the technical level. Sometimes this focus only on law enforcement power is short-sighted and even counterproductive, I will say, because it can undermine human rights. For instance, by sweeping in online dissent, speech, political activities, a supposed form of cybercrime. And because it can interfere with the work of people who are actually trying to make us safer, to improve security at the technical level. Some provisions in the treaty in threatens to criminalize the essential work of independent security researchers in identifying vulnerabilities and getting them fixed. Other provisions threaten to allow governments to compel engineers to undermine and bypass security measures in the name of furthering an investigation. These proposals can be interpreted in a very broad way, which could require uh, compel an engineer, someone with knowledge on computer systems, to secretly turn over keys and password, even without their employer's knowledge. So these go against cybersecurity, and these tariffs are complex, but the media has the responsibility to try to explain these issues in an easy way, to understand not, so, not only the criminal landscape of ransomware, which is important, but also the, the whole importance of the whole cybersecurity ecosystem. So this broader perspective is important for one reason, it would show how the landscape of cybersecurity is just not cops and robbers, so many people other than law enforcement and criminals play a crucial role. Second, because it might emphasize that cyber attacks are not magic and their perpetrators are not wizards. At all at the core of cyber can attack have detail grounded in the operations of ICT systems and protection fixes and countermeasures. So the media can demystify those attacks this mysticizing those attacks can also reduce the public's sense of powerlessness in the face of them. And finally, to conclude, it could also show opportunities for cooperation on strengthening our infrastructure. For example, between tech companies and independent and academic researchers, or for cooperation between government and technologies in proactively strengthening ICT systems and promoting cybersecurity research and testing. And that's something that the media can also promote in their own narrative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gertitza. You bring very important concepts. For example, the, the importance of security by design in all, the, in all the devices, the importance of knowing the vulnerabilities. For example, in, in the National Cert of Argentina, we have a policy that once we know about a vulnerability, we, we do communicate it to our, to our um, the, well, the, the, the areas of the government that we are um, in, in, in contact with. And also, also you, you mentioned the important role of the media in, in, in getting to know and informing the, the public about what is happening. And uh, we were talking yesterday in an open forum that we organized exactly that, that sometimes we, we get to know about attacks only by the media, and sometimes those who have been attacked or uh, in, in vulnerable situation not usually share all the information, and, and so the role of the media is really relevant. Thank you for your comments, and we will get back to you in a moment. Now I'd like to ask Alisa a question. Um, Alisa, how can the Internet Governance Forum, where we are now, play a proactive role in promoting a human-centric approach to cybersecurity and facilitating the exchange of insights and experiences? between global cybersecurity initiatives and practical on-the-ground efforts, which is mainly the purpose of this session. And welcome, and, and thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, I actually think it's worth a little bit of background about why I'm here on the stage to begin with, um, and then I can actually uh, tackle that question. Uh, Cloudflare is a, a global cybersecurity company uh, with, uh, with equipment and operations in more than 100 countries. Uh, it, we, we protect people all around the world with millions of customers. Uh, in fact, something like 20% of, of all of the websites in the world pass through our network on a daily basis. 
Um, one of the things that's interesting for, uh, for me on this stage is that we fit in a couple of different places as a member of industry. Um, we're both a cybersecurity company uh, that is uh, involved in, in seeing attacks, um, but what we also just protect a lot of what's happening on, on, on the internet and in internal networks. So we play sort of on both sides of that game um, and, and really have an, an opportunity to think about what those issues look like. Um, so thinking about that question, you know, one of the things that we do at Cloudflare is we try to make it easy for people to protect themselves, recognizing in this space that prevention is actually better than addressing cybercrime in many ways. Um, if the goal, there's a goal in cybersecurity to protect in the first instance, to prevent cybercrime altogether, uh, which actually solves some of the challenges. And so those questions are really tied very closely together because it's not just about enforcement. If you can prevent cybercrime in the first place, that is a much better place to be overall. And so from a from a a, from the point of industry, um, thinking about what those solution sets look like, making sure that you have things that are secure by design, that are easy to implement from a protection standpoint is incredibly important. Um, I think on the cybercrime side, um, I think one of the, the things that we've seen just from a practical standpoint is often um, there are gaps in uh, you know, cybercrime is global. Let's just be honest, it crosses borders. Um, and practically, sometimes uh, that means international collaboration on the law enforcement side. And so some of the discussion points have to be about making sure that those barriers are addressed um, and addressed in a sort of human-centric way um, that, that protects rights. Uh, those are all in important components. Um, on, on the question of IGF in particular, you know, one of the things that Cloudflare does is we, we offer an, a bunch of initiatives that actually provide protections to vulnerable groups in particular. Uh, we think about secure by design, uh, and uh, we try to think about what those offerings look like and make sure that people understand what they can do to protect themselves. Uh, so we actually think a forum like IGF uh, is, is a place where you can have those discussions about what initiatives are available for people to protect themselves to make sure that, again, that prevention, those steps on prevention uh, in the first place are are thought through um, and that people are aware of what is out there even before you get to the cybercrime side. Um, I think on the, the other thing, the amazing thing about IGF is that it's multi-stakeholder. So you actually have not only governments in the room, um, but civil society in the room. You have industry in the room. You have a lot of different players who all bring a different piece to that puzzle and can have a conversation together. Um, and there aren't that many forums like that. So thinking about that practically, uh, that is, I think, one of the biggest things that IGF can do, really thinking about that piece. How do we make sure that people know what initiatives are out there? And then also, what are the real barriers to, uh, to enforcement? Um, what are the challenges that come into play? Thank you, Alisa. I think you, you really made a good point about the role of the IGF in bridging gaps in between the different stakeholders, which I think it's fantastic space. And also this concept of equal footing, that you can find authorities, ministers, experts from so, uh, uh, person from civil society, experts from the technical community and exchange some ideas and, and have a coffee or share a, a bento uh, and, and some sushi. And, uh, and that, that, that bridging that gap is, is really important. That sometimes in, 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 in these multilateral meetings, uh, which are also very important, it's not so easy. And uh, there are some barriers that prevent some of the stakeholders in participating freely and exchanging uh, information with other stakeholders. So I will give the floor to my dear colleague, Tracy. Now the floor is yours to continue with questions to other panelists. Thank you very much, Olga. And just a few housekeeping and um, guidance. Just at the end of this round of questions, we'll be asking you to come to the mics or go on Zoom and ask your questions. So get ready for that so you can probably begin lining up as soon as we um, begin the question period. And secondly, one of our speakers in this round will be speaking in Spanish. So if you uh, don't have a, an interpretation available and you don't speak Spanish, it's a good time to try and um, look for those devices. Or I guess if you speak English, you can follow the, the transcript. All right. So moving on now to one of our remote speakers, Elisaveta. She's from the Alliance for the Protection of Children in the Digital Environment. So Elisaveta, how can we promote the adoption of best practices, such as self-regulation mechanisms and social initiatives to foster collaboration in combating digital threats and reducing risks with a particular emphasis 
on safeguarding children in the online environment. Elizaveta. Let's not forget that one of the most important part of our society is, of course, children. And so protecting children from cybersecurity and cybercrime is of utmost importance. And that has been increasing over the last couple of years. And this is the reason why we created the Russian Alliance for the Protection of Children in the Digital Environment. This trend is something that we saw beginning in 2023 in the BRICS summit, where the ministers of the, ministers of the digital development of respective country openly expressed their commitment to the issue of protecting children in the digital environment, calling for the creation of this interstate alliance for the protection of children. And these statements once again emphasize the relevance of this topic, not only in Europe, but in countries of the global south. Now, speaking on behalf of the Russian IT society, I can safely argue that voluntary commitments of digital platforms and major players in the IT market are the most effective way of public mobilization aimed at protecting children on the Internet. Let me once again emphasize that this is precisely an independent initiative of the largest IT companies of Russia. The alliance promotes the protection of the youngest generation from cybercrime through not restrictions, not through restrictions, but through education, creation of positive content, such as games, podcasts, etc. And as an example, for more precise measures, allow me to mention that we created the Digital Ethics of Childhood mm -hmm. Charter, which reflects the recommendations concerning the issue of child safety, parents, it's from parents, teachers, and others. And this is soft law. It's based on ethical principles, the respect for the child as an individual, shared responsibility, the protection of privacy and values in the online space, as well as inclusivity. One of the key points expressed in the Charter is self-regulation of digital platforms in terms of proactive content moderation. This means that platforms themselves have to vow to take steps to prevent the spread of negative content that could potentially harm children. In addition, the Alliance also works to improve digital literacy for children and adults. This, for example, has led to one point years of existence of the Alliance, making more than 20 events. And this is an important step in protecting children in the digital environment. What it demonstrates is that given the right conditions, major digital platforms are actually willing to admit their responsibilities and take actions to shield children from negative content and other online threats without government interference. Considering the risk for children in the era of global digitalization means that it should be noted that the greatest concern here is the threat of sexual exploitation and abuse on the internet. It has never been easier for sex offenders to contact their potential victims, share images, and encourage others to commit crimes. And here is an example. Let me mention the fact that about 80% of children in 25 countries report feeling at risk of sexual abuse or exploitation online. That's a UN statistic. Indeed, the problem of sexual exploitation and sexual violence, and in general, the abundance of content that exists on the internet containing images and scenes of sexual nature that can cause mental trauma to a child, is the most acute issue that really needs to be solved. Unfortunately, this is something that we have not yet solved. Despite the efforts of the global community and international organizations, we're still very far from solving this problem. The World Health Organization, in its 2022 report on preventing online violence, focused on child sexual abuse and highlighted that the particular issue is very, very important. The We Protect Global Alliance emphasizes in its information resource that, and I quote here, access to child sexual abuse material online is becoming easier and easier. And the volume is growing so much that we could say we're experiencing a tsunami of child sexual abuse material online, end quote. So we all are well aware that a primary school child can easily, with literally three clicks, access content that is so highly traumatic and can cause serious psychological trauma. And something has to be done about this, of course. I would also say that there are general statistics about the number of incidents and cases with negative consequences for a child's health. And this clearly does not reflect the real picture because children themselves, and especially their parents in many cases, do not take such incidents out into the public space. They don't complain about it. So therefore, 
law enforcement and other agencies aren't asked for help. So what additional steps can we do here to protect children from sexual exploitation and sexual abuse online? How can we strengthen the fight against the spread of this sexual abuse material? And in general, how can we prevent the spread of sexually explicit content that threatens the mental health of children? The most effective and practical measures, in our opinion, are the following. First of all, exchange of data on the localization of materials that are harmful and dangerous to children. The exchange of data on new methods, for example, and mechanisms that are used by criminals. The creation of blacklists of resources with these materials on them in child pornography as well as the exchange of data about attackers and criminals themselves. And we call them predators. Also, we need to look at blocking content creators, downloaders, and think about the consciously malicious distribution of, harm of harmful content. Moreover, such data exchange should be carried out uh, at the interstate level and between authorized organizations to protect children on the internet. We need to also have campaigns and look at digital fingerprints and hashes. For example, in 2022, 9,126 units of content were removed in the category of uh, sexual content, and this was using the hash database. Again, hash digital uh, fingerprints here. Uh, the largest tech players on the Russian IT market have participated in this. In conclusion, I'd like to invite my distinguished colleagues to join forces with me and work together. We're always open to cooperation and invite participants in today's discussion to join our digital ethics of childhood charter together, and we can help to protect future generations. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Elisabeth. Um, I thought there were some very interesting um, stats you gave there. 80% of children feel at risk of being exploited. That's fascinating. Um, I mean, I've children myself, and they're online, and 80% feel at risk. That's really, really um, troubling, especially in our part of the world where I'm from. The sex, um, child trafficking is very big, and it seems to be coming from the online world a lot. And I think we do have to take a look carefully at that. I also like the fact that you um, gave some practical examples of how we can combat this, utilizing data exchange, blacklisting, and you know, working with the authorities to get, um, get things moving as well as self-regulation. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we could take this up in the question and answer session. We find a little bit more about what you did in, in Russia to get this moving. Um, so moving on to our next question now, I'm gonna ask um, Deputy Minister um, Ernesto Rodriguez Hernandez, the threats faced by states in cyberspace are increasingly worrying. It is a topic that is widely debated on international stages. What is your opinion on the matter? And what actions do you consider could contribute to mitigating these threats? Deputy Minister. Thank you very much, Trevi and Olga. Thank you for allowing me to be able to share my thoughts on these topics which I feel are of paramount importance for all of our humanity. I believe that, first and foremost, we need to characterize cyberspace, where everything is being developed. Undoubtedly so, there is a growing development of cyber offensive capabilities. And as a matter of fact, there are national security strategies of some states which also include the possibilities of using offensive cyber weapons and also to undertake cyber offensive operations. Undoubtedly, there are now preventive cyber attacks with a view to deterring adversaries, and they can turn all of these issues, they can turn cyberspace into a new scenario of conflict. This is a danger that has now been heightened by the doctrines which consider the use of force as a response, a legitimate response to a cyber attack. Secondly, increasingly, there is a more covert and illegal use of other nations' computer systems by individuals, organizations, 
and also states to carry out computer attacks against third countries. In addition, this can also be a trigger for international conflict. The misuse of information and communication technologies and media platforms, I'm referring to social networks and radio and electronic broadcasts, as a tool for interventionism by promoting hate speech, incitement to violence, subversion, destabilization, the dissemination of false fake news, all of this with a with political purpose against other states. And this is a pretext for them to use this force. This also constitutes an increasing threat to nations and where it is more important to abide by these international principles of international law. Where are these actions, are, where are they being undertaken? They are being part now, they are part of a so-called fourth generation warfare, which is rooted in manipulating emotions, the use of information that has been stored and processed in the clear violation of issues that are so important like protecting personal data rights. And many companies also are involved in this. They turn all of this into a business model. All of this is taking place in an international context with various threats, with armed conflicts, unconventional wars, attempts at regime changes, and frequent violations of the United Nations Charter, as well as violating international law. This is the environment where these actions in cyberspace are being carried out. Now, the question is, what is it that we can do to counteract all of these threats? First and foremost, I think that we must undertake a global commitment so that the use of ICTs are used only for peaceful purposes, for the benefit of cooperation and the development of peoples. We must also do away with the colossal technological gap, which are obstacles and a hindrance for these developing countries to invest in the security of their ICTs. And that is the current state of affairs. It is dire. It is essential. And we have also spoken uh, about this in many states. We need to adopt an international instrument, which is legally binding, which complements the applicable international law, which also should respond to the significant legal gaps in the sphere of cybersecurity and to effectively address the growing challenges and threats through international cooperation. It is of paramount importance to increase cooperation in order to grapple with cyber incidents. And as part and parcel of of this exchange, we need to exchange information which does not compromise the privacy of states, nor should it violate any national legislation. We must also implement technical assistance mechanisms to exchange good practices which would enable us to grapple with all of these incidents and also should bolster the operational capabilities vis-a-vis -vis a cyber attack. As much as possible, we should also standardize all of these cyber attacks. We should use common terminology which fosters exchange, international exchange, and finally, I think that is also of paramount importance. We need to set a multilateral mechanism under the auspices of the United Nations to determine impartially and unequivocally the origin of all of these incidents related to the use of ICTs. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Again, some very valuable points raised. Um, you, you pointed to the violation of international law um, that is used to you know, involve um, state actors um, in cyberspace and you theater of war, for one more better word. Um, but I think your, your call for the use of ICT to be used for development purposes and for peace, I think that is really something that we need to take a closer look at. And as you said, the call for an international instrument to complement existing international law, I think is something we, we could discuss um, as we get into the question and answer session. Thank you very much for your, for your comments. Um, again, questions and answers coming up after this. 
round of questions. I'm going to go to uh, Fulake Olagunyu, who's from the ECOWAS. And she's going to give, I think, a very practical take on what's happening in West Africa. So, Fulake, the economic community of West African states comprises 15 states. Which are the main challenges that these countries face in relation to cybercrime and cybersecurity? Over to you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, so rightly, as Elisa rightly said, um, the issues we're talking about today are completely global. So that would actually put into context what I'm about to, to say. So what we're seeing within the West African region is obviously um, just a, a quick geographical background here. The 15 member states, um, 11 of them are actually classified as LDCs. So you can already envisage the sort of issues and challenges they already have without even putting cyber into place. So what we've seen over the last few years is that we're lacking a national coordination at the national level, which is then leveraging into an effective cooperation at the regional level. Um, we've seen that um, not only cyber is global, it is also a trust game. And for that to actually happen effectively, countries actually need to speak to one another. And for them to do that, they have to be willing to collaborate to actually combat the cyber threats. Uh, this obviously requires adherence to international conventions. We're talking about the Budapest Conventions uh, on the African side. We're talking about the Malabo Convention. But aside from that, we're talking about the member states actually having the capacity and the capability to actually coordinate and collaborate with one another. Um, resources is a big thing that is lacking on the side of the world. And resources has three levels. We've got the technical, the financial, and again, the human. Globally, we, we do acknowledge that um, there is a death of cybersecurity workforce personnel. But on, on this side of the world, I think it, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more critical. We do have personnel that are highly qualified that can do the job, but we don't have enough of those of those people available. So it's it's an issue of how do we then cascade down the little knowledge that we have so that it actually makes an impact across the region. Finances, um, a lot of our budgets are actually not concentrated on, on cybersecurity. I think one or two member states have actually put into their national budgets a very thin line on cybersecurity. We're trying to see how we can um, encourage member states to do a bit more. Again, on the technical front, uh, the, there's a lack of the requisite equipment and facilities actually required to actually do the job. Aside from that, I think um, we're not only... Um, the, the region hasn't gotten to the point where you're seeing cyber as um, a warfare like other parts of the region. So the mentality is still sort of boots on ground. We're still looking at physical security, and I think that conversation needs to be leveraged a bit more. Uh, I will say and, uh, that there was a watershed moment. Um, I, I think everyone talks about pre-COVID and after COVID. And I think COVID was a watershed moment for the West African region because a lot of conversations prior to that had revolved around the socioeconomic, um, socioeconomic development issues that the, the region faces. But what COVID actually did was it brought digitalization to the forefront because everyone was obviously not prepared. And then you had to now make sure your citizens could actually meet their daily needs and requirements. And I think the good thing if I can say that, and I use that very loosely, the good thing about COVID is that um, because conversations about dis digitalization were brought to the forefront, member states now have to start thinking about security. And um, it's getting the attention it needs, and I'm going to borrow Chris Painter's word here, about sustained attention. I think what we're trying to do from the Commission's perspective now is to actually ramp up and promote that our member states actually start doing a bit more when it comes to cybersecurity. Some are doing very well, others are not. Uh, but it's, it's our mandate to ensure that as the 15 member states come together, that they actually do more because the region promotes um, free mood, movement of goods and people. So you can imagine if we're promoting free movement of goods and people, we're also indirectly promoting the free movement of cyber threats across the region. So we need to do a bit more. Um, I think also one of the things that is a really big issue is the weak critical infrastructure that we have. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know about what goes on in Africa. I'll speak specifically about West Africa. As, um, the grids are down, uh, sometimes telecommunication masters are down. It's uh, a comme d'habitude 
for, for the people on this side of the world not having energy or sometimes not having lights, uh, power grid, um, social infrastructure. So if we do sort of go two, three years from now and um, a cyber attack occurs on any of our critical infrastructure, a lot of people will be nonetheless wiser because they're already used to not having this infrastructure. So uh, it's a key challenge within the side of the world. We're trying to see how we can promote the development of these infrastructure, make sure they're actually built to a capacity that can actually help its citizens, um, trying to promote a bit more cooperation and coordination amongst our member states. We, we, we're trying to ensure that um, there's that peer-to-peer -peer cooperation um, it's not constantly looking towards the global north because the nuances are different, the environment are different. We talk, we're talking to member states that have done fairly well, and actually, I, I will take that back, member states that are doing really, really well within the side of the region to actually pick up other countries that have not, show them what they have done so that we can actually collectively address these challenges together. Like um, Elisabeth rightly said, um, one of the things that she is seeing in her own thematic in terms of child protection is the exchange of data. That is not just about um, children, which is very important, but I think it's a cross section of actually promoting information sharing on cybersecurity, on cybercrime as a whole. And that is still lacking within the side of the world, and we're trying to see how we can do that. Um, like Katiza rightly said, incentives. Um, a lot of the, the workers within the sector, the public sector, are not incentivized enough to actually do more. So it's a way of try we need to try and figure out a creative way to encourage government, public sector, to actually do more, to incentivize their people to actually stay train them, retrain them, or make them pivot to other areas where they can actually use the skills they already have. Involve the private sector and see how we can use that PPP collaboration to sort of move the cybersecurity landscape, improve the resilience and strengthen it across the West African region. I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Falaki. And I think you had some extraordinary points there on how we can work together, collective action. Uh, what I pulled that out um, as a small and developing state um, citizen myself, I think we do have opportunities to work together to learn from each other and, and share best practices. In, in my particular um, re, um, field of work at the UPU, we are establishing an ISAC, Information Sharing and Analysis Center, and I think that's very useful um, for the postal sector in this case, but maybe sectoral ISACs within West Africa, within um, other regions can be one uh, way we can look at this. You also mentioned the issue of limited resources, um, limited resource budgetary and people. Again, and that's a problem in many um, least developed countries and SIDS, um, underserved regions as a whole. So I think we, we do need to get that support. But again, with collective action working together, we can um, probably drive this forward. I really appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, so now we're moving to questions. Questions and answers. And answers. So, <laughs> Olga, maybe we could um, yeah. see what's happening on the floor on the on online. Do we have colleagues in in the room that would like to make questions to our speakers or comments or remarks, adding to what we have been hearing? Uh, there are mics in in the room that you can line up, or um, we may have questions from remote. Do we have questions from remote? It's a quiet afternoon. In the meantime, I would like to thank Fulake for her comments. I think she, she really summarized very well all the, the major concerns that, that we all have, especially in developing countries, not only in West Africa, and that we, we, we share the same, uh, same challenges in, in all the developing countries in the world. Uh, no comments, questions from audience? I don't see hands. Some comments, questions from remote? Okay, one minute. We have uh, one question online, um, and it's from Riyad Hassan, uh, fr Vice Chair, Bangladesh Youth IGF, and a member of the Bangladesh Remote Hub. And the question is, how can we ensure effective use of emerging technologies to ensure cybersecurity? Is, is addressed to any speaker? No, or? no, no. 
any, so, uh, so the question is, um, how can we ensure effective use of emerging technologies to ensure cybersecurity? How do we ensure the use of emerging technologies um, to ensure security? Okay. Effective use of emerging technologies to ensure cybersecurity. Okay. Who would like to address? Oh, yes, please, Elisa, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, one of the reasons I wanted to take that one um, is because I think one of the things that we're talking about a lot right now um, is really that idea of secure by design to secure by default, so that would be one. Um, and the, the other piece on the emerging tech side, I think it's been said a lot at IGF, but um, there is a reality that AI is coming for cybersecurity as well. Uh, and actually, um, it's a that can be a positive. I think we see both the negative um, potential for AI and cybersecurity in the world of, uh, of things that you could use for exploitation. Um, but the positive of that is that there are, um, there are a lot of systems where AI can actually help. Um, if you're talking about big data sets, for example, identifying vulnerabilities quickly, uh, being able to patch quickly, being able to identify them in sort of real time um, and correct, all of those things are, um, are coming. Um, and I think that the reality of being able to to make sure that we have systems that enable that is incredibly important. Um, I do think, uh, I, th I think that we are going there. Um, I think that's one of those areas for global co co collaboration as well, um, because when you start talking about data sets and information sharing, um, a lot, of, a lot of tech, a lot of uh, requires, and AI certainly requires big data sets. So being able to do that for, uh, for um, cybersecurity systems, uh, making sure that you have ac adequate access to data to enable that protection is important. Fantastic. Chris, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I might, add, <coughs> I might add that I agree with everything you said. I, I'd say that um, emerging technologies are part of the larger problem, but we can't lose sight of the larger cybersecurity issue too. And one of the things that we didn't talk about yet, and something that my uh, colleague from ECOWAS mentioned, is when we've had these UN meetings, when I've talked to countries from around the world, almost to uh, a person, for, you know, for, especially for the developing world, the global south, their number one interest is they need help. They need capacity building. They need the ability to actually deal with these threats, whether they be nation state threats or criminal threats, uh, they need to be able to actually uh, take things that have been decided in the UN, like norms of behavior and, and international law, and apply them. They need to be able to have certs, uh, emergency response teams. They need to have national strategies. They need all of these things. And of course, when you're looking at new technologies, you build that in. So the fear a little bit is you see these new technologies and it becomes a bright, shiny object and you forget about the foundation you have to build for all of these things. And what the GFC does, what the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise does, is it really does that coordinates that capacity building around the world. It's multi-stakeholder. We have 200 members and partners, uh, countries, civil society, uh, industry, academia. And the whole idea is to work around the world to make sure that countries and, and others are up to speed. You know, they have these basic things in place, and, they, and it's a sharing platform where they can work with each other. So I think that's, you know, as I think about practical aspects of this, as opposed to sort of the political and other aspects, the most practical aspect is just helping countries protect themselves, both from new uh, threats, but also from existing threats, and, and really build that capability around the world. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have two colleagues lining up. I, I didn't see who was coming first, so. Colleague uh, on the right came first. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Jimson Ulufuye, uh, based in Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, I have two comments. Uh, well, before the two comments, just to comment the panel, thank you for the work you've been doing, uh, Chris, Oga, and everyone in particular. Uh, the, the first comment is to corroborate what Falake has been saying concerning scenario in West Africa. Uh, that is really awakening, you know, like with regard to the good part of COVID. So digitalization is a serious business. And with it, of course, cybersecurity, and uh, that is to say that uh, uh, we need to take cybersecurity very seriously, indeed, because a lot of things are moving online. Uh, secondly, uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa uh, sponsored a, a kind of uh, research to measure the link between cybersecurity and development. Uh, the objective is to uh, present to policymakers to take cybersecurity more seriously based on data. 
And uh, it showed that uh, a 10% increase in cybersecurity maturity kind of yield between 0.66 and 5.4% increase in GDP per capita. So with this, you can see that indeed, if you take cybersecurity seriously, then there will be value add even to the economic power of the citizens. So just to bring that uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Uh, so first of all, thank you for that. And I was at the IGF and Addis last year where they launched that study. And I'd say that that is really critical. If you think, and other speakers have said this, a lot of the interest around the world uh, pre-pandemic, but even now, is seizing the digital economy, digitization. You know, often the economic parts of government don't talk to the security parts of government, uh, or the communities don't even talk. But to achieve that digitization, to achieve that economic growth, strong cybersecurity helps you. It's the platform to achieve that, and that's where capacity building comes in. But having statistics like that, which really makes it concrete, I think helps sell this more to make it the political priority it needs to be for the sustainable effort that we know, need over time and not just another like boutique effort, but one that's really important as part of it. Thank you, Chris. Any other comments from colleagues? Uh, speakers remote would like to make any remark or comment about the two questions that we have received or comments? No? Okay. Can I join in? For some strange reason, I can't find my raise hand. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so just to quickly tap into what Chris said, um, yes, the GFC is actually doing amazing work, but I, I think the approach the GFC is taking is, is the best approach, or it's, it's a good approach, because they're also trying to leverage on regional economic communities such as the ECOWAS. And the ECOWAS Commission has been working with the GFC over the last few years to see how they can actually drill down that capacity building to make it more meaningful to the member countries that are involved. Because obviously, if you think about it, if you're trying to do capacity building from a global level, it would not actually tap down into what really matters to me working and living in West Africa, for example. Uh, so that was just one point. Um, the second point was to what um, Jimson was saying. Yes, um, we are aware of the UNECA um, report, but I also wanted to say, again, it needs to be drilled down again. Um, we're looking at trying to promote cybersecurity or encourage more member states to be more cyber aware. To do that, we need the awareness, we need the evidence, and we need the practicality of how it has worked. Um, we cannot, for example, take what has worked in the US and bring it to West Africa and expect it to work without actually having meaningful engagements with the people on the streets. So for, for that to work, there needs to be a practical angle. And one last point, just to quickly sort of go back to what Tracy was saying about ISACs. That's a very important point you have mentioned there. It's one of the approaches the commission has taken. Uh, we've just started uh, a new program that was launched under the G7 German pre presidency. It's the joint platform for advancing cybersecurity in West Africa. And one of the things we're looking at is actually setting up an ISAC. So it will be good to see how we can also see what you have done and how we can leverage on that. Thank you very much, Olga, for giving me the floor. Thank you. Yes, Sorry, and I don't mean to, uh, to hog the mic, but just uh, uh, relaxing that comment. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, or maybe more than a couple of years ago, we recognized exactly what was being said, that this has to be a demand-driven approach. It can't just be layered on. You just can't say, here's some programs, go run with it. That's not sustainable. So having it both globally and regionally driven is really important. And, and we worked to create an African experts group. We've worked in the different uh, communities. We're having a big conference in Ghana at the end of November, bringing the development community and the cyber community together. But we also have a hub in uh, with the OAS in, uh, in the Latin American, Caribbean, and North American region. We have something in ASEAN. We have just launched a Pacific hub for the Pacific Islands. It's important to have both of those together. And they can share information across them, because although the lessons might be different, there might be lessons that can be learned from other approaches. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Tracy, you would like to uh, uh, ask, let, let our colleague to of make course. the other question. So, over to you, colleague at the mic. Yes, just state your name and where you're from. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Jacob Pepijn Baljet. I'm from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. And I do have a question. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, everyone. And, and I think it's very uh, great that we have this panel talking about end cyber capacity building and cyber crime and responsible state behavior because I think all those three topics are equally important. 
uh, when we are discussing how to increase cyber resilience. Uh, and I, I do have a question well, for the Deputy Minister, but also for the other panelists, maybe. Uh, the Deputy Minister was talking about the, the proposed or the, the perceived need for a legally binding instrument on, uh, on responsible state behavior in addition to international law. And, uh, well, I mean, we've had a lot of discussions on international law in the, the UN level. And uh, I was wondering, regarding these discussions, uh, and also considering that already at the UN level it was agreed that international law is applicable in, in, in cyberspace. And of course we are all uh, working out, or tech real experts uh, are actually working out, other than me, uh, what, uh, how international law is exactly applicable to cyberspace and how these specific rules would be applicable. Um, and so I was wondering if you could elaborate on how a new or new negotiations on a legally binding instrument are actually related to this ongoing effort to find out how these existing rules apply to cyberspace and how, uh, because of course I don't think we want to be premature in, in, uh, in starting negotiations on something when we are still trying to figure out as a global community how international law applies and, and many countries have already uh, shared their national views on how international law applies. And I think it's very important that all countries do that before we go to, uh, to see whether there are gaps that we need to, to fill with a new treaty. And also, since we are here at the IGF, I think it's important to say that when we are talking about international law and cyberspace, that really it should not only be international lawyers uh, looking at that, but that we also really need the technical community and civil society and all stakeholders to think about that, because it's, it's really it's an issue that is uh, not only for those uh, writing about international law. Thank you very much. Yes, please, go ahead. Sí. Eh, gracias por la pregunta. Y voy a I appreciate this question. I will strive to be very concise since we don't have much time. First and foremost, there is indeed an international debate that is deeply rooted in both of these issues. There is a need to have a binding regulatory framework. Also, the applicability of international law, and very specifically in terms of international humanitarian law, in terms of security vis-a-vis -vis ICTs. I feel that there is one scientific element that's important, what we are going to have, have to grapple with. This is a completely different environment. Cyberspace is highly dynamic the various topics that trigger conflicts and also safeguard international security are very different from the traditional ones that we knew before from yesteryear. Therefore, I feel that we cannot think that the current existing standards, the good practices which strive to proliferate their, their use and the responsible use within cyberspace that are necessary indeed for us to be able to have a safe cyberspace where we work together geared toward development. As a matter of fact, I feel that we have addressed this topic here. We've talked about disruptive technologies, emerging technologies as well. This means that there are new standards and that they need to be binding. It cannot be voluntary and it should not, the state should not decide whether they will be abiding by these laws. I think that we need to all be on an equal footing. All countries, we must abide by them. They need to safeguard, they need to favor, foster a peaceful cyberspace geared toward cooperation and the development of peoples. Uh, so first of all, thank you for that question and thank you to the Netherlands because they launched the GFC, so thank you for that. But taking my GFC off, cap off for a moment and based on my prior experience, look, I, I think that the norms of behavior that have been agreed to by every country in the UN, all, every one of them, they are, they are voluntary, but they're political commitments by those countries. And so if they agree to do that, they should be held accountable for that. Other countries should hold them accountable. And we've seen violations, and the accountability hasn't been there. So it doesn't matter if you had a new treaty or not. 
if we've seen treaties violated all the time, and if there's not accountability, they, are, they end up just being words on paper. I do think doing a treaty at this point is premature. I think the norms are a good step. I think there's more development that needs to be done. A lot of countries, even though they agree to the norms, don't know what they mean. So you have to build, I think, on this. And, and also, you know, there's a challenge because some countries, uh, when they think of a treaty, think of a treaty about information. They, they worry about what they think is harmful information. And so that gets very much into human rights and free speech, and I worry about how that plays out as well. So I'm, I think a treaty is, is far down the pike right now. I think there's a lot we have to do, including capacity building, which is a more urgent thing to do right now. I just want to add, actually, I agree with that, um, Chris. I, I, think from the, uh, I think from the industry standpoint, one of the things that becomes challenging for us is that when you try to define things in a treaty, uh, you know, the, one of the fears from industry is that you might end up actually less secure. Uh, so you know, one of the challenges from a practical standpoint that has come up in some of the treaty negotiations, for example, is the question of um, access for researchers trying to do security research, what that then means. If you try to define that prematurely, you actually risk a world where uh, where vulnerabilities don't get patched um, because there is too, there are too many legally uh, legal challenging legal questions around it, um, and I think that's really concerning from a um, from a from a practical standpoint for industry. So um, I will say I think I think industry sort of watches these questions really carefully. Uh, you know, we've been sort of strong proponents of of, of norms um, in the space, um, really trying to think about. You know, we look at it very much from a protection uh, across the board from, a, uh, from an industry standpoint. Um, so we've been trying to look at what actually promotes that um, primarily uh, and really thinking about what that looks like um, just for, for everyone on the ground. Yes, thank you very much. And I know the time is short, but we do have one more question from the floor for this round. Um, state your name and proceed. Hello. My name is Dr. Mona Hauck, and I'm from Germany. And I have been working in EU projects, AI, um, medical area, for the last few years. And I'm not, I'm not an AI technique, I'm working with experts. And I have been responsible of supporting doctoral networks within the EU. So my experience, and this got triggered by what was Falak is saying, is that I wonder, I have seen so many experts all over the world. Um, I've been working with more than 16 nations, and it's amazing. But the knowledge and all the lessons learned, and I work in business industries, big major companies, the knowledge gets lost. And I wonder if I listen to Falaka, if there's not a way of somehow creating a knowledge pool with all the technology that is available to not only think about like cybersecurity, but the people who create cybersecurity, the people who um, you want to teach kind of like a certain mindset. So in order to avoid bias and to include gender aspects on all the things. So um, we've been creating kind of like a certain uh, best practice case for the EU. And it was the first time that we uh, that we did it by applying, by kind of like, sorry, um, coaches who supported the tech experts, people who were trained like from social sci uh, psychologists and social science. And I was wondering, and all these things, because so much gets lost if people are focusing on tech and not including the other aspects, if there's anything. So my vision is that there is a worldwide knowledge pool where people from Africa and Southwest Africa can just kind of like access to it. And it's although we, we, we did, we, uh, there are questions on the corners. I'm wondering if we could just take the other questions and then pull them together. What do you think? Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. And I was wondering if, if uh, remote uh, experts would like to make any comment or respond to any of the comments that we have received. All right. So thanks for your question. Let's go to colleague on the right and then colleague on the on my left and my right and then we'll pull them together and get them all answered. So go ahead, sir. Thank you, Tracy. I'm Kosi Amesinu from Benin. I'm from Ministry of Economy and Finance of Benin. I thank Folake uh, for her intervention. I have just one question for her. 
I want to know if it's possible to use solar technology to solve the gap of uh, lack of electricity for critical telecommunication infrastructure in West Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. And question on colleague on my right. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce myself. This is Ganesh. I work for the government of Nepal as a secretary in the prime minister's office. Uh, we discuss a lot about the cyber security as well as the cyber crime. And we discuss little about the cyber security and the children. UN report shows that, report shows that one in five girls and one in 13 boys have been sexually exploited or abused before reaching the age of 18. Don't you think this is the serious thing to our future challenge? So concerning this, I would like to raise some of the things that need to be considered. First of all, having a kind of holistic approach for all cybersecurity may not be functioning. So we need a separate compact to address the challenges of the cybersecurity related to the children because of their specific necessity and the specific characteristics of the children. The second thing I would like to emphasize that one of the speakers already said about the building the capacity of the children themselves through the uh, internet governance as well as some, some of the internet technology by, by giving digital literacy about uh, making aware of about their right. So this, this might be the one of the most important things to save from the online safety measures. The third thing that is most important due to the nature of the cross-border uh, issue of the cybersecurity, we need cross-border regional international collaboration across member states and the private sector and the ICT companies. That is very important in addressing technology facilitated child uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. This is the third thing I would like to emphasize. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I think we have an online yes. intervention. Thank you, Tracy. We have some questions online uh, from Rowana from Sri Lanka. What is the impact of cyber crimes conventions to cyber crime investigations? And another question from Amir. What, what should be done when some cross-border digital platform refuse to cooperate with national competent authorities regarding cyber crime cases and refuse to establish official representative in the country? Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, address the, the question made by a colleague from Germany. Um, I, I agree with you, this is a relevant desire from many of us of having this pool of knowledge, and, and especially to be shared among different countries and regions. Just to, to let you know that there are some efforts in, in preparing a database of experts, at least in the Organization of American States, or correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, and also in the open-ended working group on, on cybersecurity in the United Nations. They were working on a database of all the experts of different countries, which is not the whole picture, but it, it's a start. And it, it should be an ongoing process. But what, what is difficult from these efforts is to keep them updated. And it's ex sometimes it's expensive and, and complicated, but, but I think it's an idea that should be, that should all, we all have in mind. I think the UN, the UN effort is more points of contact for a CBM, so it's more limited. And, and I'd say that it's a great idea. Um, and part of what you're saying is being able to, to translate between the policy and technical people, too, which I think is important. I, I'd mention the Sybil portal again, which is what my organization has, which now has 
over 800 uh, best practices, guides, uh, tools that can be used, and it's open to everyone, not just members of the GFC at civilportal.org, but there are other things out there, and I think we're building toward that. And who would like Olga? to? Olga, do you hear me? Sorry? Olga? Yes, for Lake, I think for Lake is trying to speak. No, oh, I would like Oh, Katitza. Okay. Olga? Ah, perdón. Sorry, Katitza, I, I didn't see you. you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please go ahead. I'm so sorry. And we have we have QSI and the queue. We will go to you in a moment, QSI. Nice to see you there. Katitza, okay. first yours. The challenge of remote participation, but I'm very grateful to be able to participate online. So thank you, Olga. Um, so uh, there were many questions that were very interesting um, through the discussions. One of them is relating to the application of international human rights law or international human rights uh, or international law. I will respond this when it comes to the negotiation of the UN Sovereign Grand Treaty. I don't want to confuse my answer with the other negotiation of the WEG, uh, which uh, there is no treaty. But when it comes to the UN Sovereign Grand Treaty, we have seen that many of the powers for criminal investigations, including across borders, are obligatory, while some of the, the safeguards are optional. Moreover, the, the chapter on international cooperation on, um, on international cooperation should be subject to international human rights law. There should be in the treaty specific safeguards that protect or are the baseline for international cooperation. But instead, the treaty deferred to national law what uh, the level of protection of privacy. This means that when one country wants to assist another on cooperating in investigating a crime, the law that will apply is the law of the country that is providing the assistance in collecting the evidence. But as we see in a, can, in a joint negotiation with 1,900 countries and more, the level of privacy protections and the level of human rights differed country by country. So if we don't have a minimum baseline on the chapter uh, on international cooperations that all states should comply with, we are leaving, we are allowing very strong cross-border surveillance powers with almost minimum of just leaving to national law to decide the level of protection what it is. And that could be very bad in many countries. And we are talking about surveillance powers that are very invasive, like real-time interception communication, real-time location of data, uh, or even data that will identify a subscriber. Because in many countries, the people who speak to true power, who are just criticizing their governments, end up being criminalized just for posting a tweet. And sometimes people get criminalized in many countries just, for instance, for being um, oh, LGBTQ, for being themselves, because that's sometimes crimes in that country. So the issue that providing uh, international cooperation and letting countries decide what the crimes that will be allowed for that cooperation without restricting it to the core cyber crimes that have to be this in the treaty, open the door of providing a legal basis of international cooperation for crimes that for some countries could be crimes, and I call it deemed crimes, but it could be also uh, a act of expression in many other countries. So without clear respect of international human rights law, clear safeguards in the treaty that are the basis for the negotiation and a narrow scope limited to core cyber crimes and crimes that are specifically define the treaty, um, the, the treaty could be too broad that we could lead to abuse. So that's one of the things that are, are, are concerning. To other question about the grounds of refusal in criminal investigations. So um, it depends, you know, sometimes companies refuse to cooperate on human rights grounds. As I said, sometimes some countries criminalize someone for being LGBTQ and self. If sometimes or sometimes uh, a journalist for writing an article or sometimes an activist for writing a post. And so sometimes 
there are grounds for refusal because the request is disproportionate, because the request is in violation of human rights law. And in those terms, it's valid for the company to be able to refuse uh, cooperation, to de deny or challenge requests that are disproportionate. Obviously, we are not talking about the requests that are necessary for the investigation for crimes that are in, in, in that respect human rights law that are necessary to fight cyber crimes. But the problem that we're having in the treaty right now is that this international cooperation will be based for any crime as defined by national law by any country, which will be a lot of crimes and it will be very difficult for the authority to be able to even know what the crime is about and in which grounds they can refuse it, which will create a lot of, um, a, it will be even very difficult for democratic countries who will willing to refuse a uh, request be, and will end, end up um, failing to, uh, failing to, uh, failing to be able to actually notice that the request is a proportionate, that the request is not comply with the legality principle that doesn't uh, follow all the criminal procedural safeguards. And it will be able not to deny the request, will end up handing over the information. And when we hand over information on a, of uh, an activist in, in, in places where, where speaking get you in jail, you can lead uh, this type of investigation can lead to torture, disappear, and, and very serious human rights abuses. Uh, it's, 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 it's opened the door for what we call transnational repression. So I just want to flag that, that grounds of refusals are important in the safeguards, are important not to undermine criminal investigations, but to be able to deny requests when these are disproportionate in violation of international human rights law. Thank you. Thank you, Gatista. I think that you have summarized very well the complexity of transnational concept of all these activities. Uh, I, I suggest that we take the question from QSI and then we let our and experts to do final comments. And, QSI, and, welcome. And perhaps we could just close and shall we close the queue after that? Yes, we Let's have close, to close, close the, the queue, queue after yes. QSI and uh, then we, we will get some final comments and, and wrap up. QSI, nice to see you and yeah. welcome. Thank you, Olga. Kusai Al Shati from Kuwait. Um, there was a talk about uh, the need of an international convention or a treaty on cyber crime, and I agree with the panels when they said this is a long way to go. Actually, we have the, and, and, and early in this century, we have the, cyber, uh, the, the, the Budapest Declaration, which was about cyber crime, and there are countries that were about 40 or more that signed that declaration. But yet, uh, the cooperation or international or cross border cooperation in cyber crime did not pick up. I wonder if we need a treaty rather than, let's say, improve or expand the role of current organizations like the Interpol, for example. The Interpol currently is working from country to country uh, when it comes uh, to uh, cyber crimes, uh, whether in the uh, exchanging information, uh, criminal investigation, uh, and facilitating uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the relation between a country to a country when it comes to uh, such an issue. Is it an option or a possibility to improve that role uh, of an organization like, for example, the Interpol, to, uh, rather than going to, for the track of a cyber crime uh, treaty or a new convention on that? Thank you. Thanks to you, Kisai. I suggest that we give the floor to each of our panelist experts, and, and then we wrap up. You can answer the questions and, and do some final comments. Uh, Chris? Yeah, thank you, Olga. Uh, just an answer to that question. Well, they are now negotiating. We have the Budapest Convention where many countries, I think it's north of 80 now, have either signed or exceeded. There is negotiations now happening in the UN for new cybercrime as opposed to cybersecurity treaty, which we were talking about, and I think that's very many years down the line. But even there, there's major differences between countries, between thoughts. Some want a very expansive view where it covers everything, including things I think would be protected human rights. Others want a, a view that's more focused on cybercrime. 
Uh, we'll see what happens. But I do agree that we need to uh, continue to improve operational coordination. Uh, Interpol is a great vehicle. Uh, we have, when I was in the government, I used to chair something called the G8 and G7 High Tech Crime Group. We created the 24-7 point of contact network that now has over 80 countries, they believe, to share information. So that operational coordination is key. And then just in my wrap-up comments, look, you know, this is a space that continues to evolve and become more and more important for everything we do. And, and you, if you're not following these negotiations in the UN, if you're not following these things that are happening in a regional basis, you should, because it really Im it impacts all the stuff we talk about, the IGF, but even much broader than that. And I think, again, one of the keys is capacity building. The keys are working with countries who need help, and that's something that you know, I invite you to join us in that. Uh, to, uh, if you're a country and you're not a member of the uh, GFC, we welcome you to become one. If you're a stakeholder, we want to engage with you too. This is, I think, and one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing this role after leaving government is I think that foundational thing about capacity building, which both helps us defeat all the bad things but also enable all the good things, is critically important and it's a practical thing we can achieve. Thank you. Alisa? So I just want to pick up on that theme of capacity building. I think, uh, I think industry has a role in that as well. Um, I think that one of the things that we see and are looking for are really to think about how we improve security for everyone. Uh, that, is not, that is not necessarily being done on the government to government side. It's really thinking about what resources are available. Again, capacity building straight up. Um, and, and then thinking about that collaboration that happens. Um, sometimes that collaboration is on information sharing related to threats. Um, I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. Um, but again, first and foremost, I think there are a lot of people that just need tools, um, understand how to protect themselves, how to make sure those attacks don't happen in the first place. Thank you. Ministro, ¿quiere hacer algunos comentarios finales? Sí, bueno. I feel that we are debating a highly complex issue. We do not have much time to make headway with the necessary resolve. The criteria that we use are divided. The standards, the binding standards as well, the treaties, the conventions, how they are also violated how they are not abided by with good practices, with good coexistence, with no binding criteria. This is something which we need to continue addressing. We need to continue speaking about it and to reach a consensus. For developing countries, it is a very difficult situation. And capacity building, which we mentioned here, they are not comparable between the developing world and the develop, developed world. What are the capabilities that a developing country has to ascertain where the cyber techs are coming from, where there's such a gap in terms of the digital divide, in terms of the information that we have access to, financing as well for development where there isn't parity. In a few words, I think that this is, these are topics which we need to continue discussing with the understanding and the responsibility that we cannot, we do not have the time to put everything in order and to fix everything in the cyber, in, in, in the world of cyberspace. As I said, we need to foster all of these conventions for the development of all of our peoples. Thank you. Um, Deputy Minister, uh, let's go to our online um, panelists. Alice Vetter, please, final words and, and responses. We, have, we literally have 30 seconds left. Well, in conclusion, I just wanted to thank my distinguished colleagues for this debate and call upon them to join our efforts and so that work together because cooperation and participating in today's uh, discussion has allowed us to further our work to protect uh, childhood, as I've mentioned, and you can find the link to our website. Um, in the information. I hope that we will be able to protect uh, children from these, cyber, uh, from these cyber threats, and I hope that we'll have a more open world. I thank you very much. Um,
Uh, thank you very much, Tracy. So I think more needs to be done to promote the development of a cybersecurity culture, which I think hopefully will lead to better communication and coordination at the national level, which then leverages to effective cooperation at the regional level. And then we can use that to strengthen our collaborations with partners and to actually then develop the capacity that is required. Thank you very much. And maybe f just five seconds from Katitza. Five seconds, Katitza. Uh, thank you. I just will conclude that for me, human rights, human rights are universal and we don't have to view them as a fundamental, fundamentally conflicting with sovereignty. In principle, these are rules that a state have already accepted and already agreed upon to govern their own uh, behavior. So in the treaty discussions on cybercrime, we have been saying that we want to see minimum safeguards that are strong for both the domestic and international surveillance powers as a minimum basis for international cooperation. But this has not made it into the current test, and this is really concerning. Instead, international cooperation may be provided by the privacy protection of the national law of the country providing the assistance, which can vary enormously and we may not meet international human rights standards. So to conclude, while uh, to the question if sovereignty and human rights inherently conflict, I will say that not necessarily. The perceived tensions stem from the state's geopolitical views and tensions, not for the principles itself. The treaty requires a minimum anchor in international human rights law and standards, ensuring that the state's collective actions respect not just individual sovereignties, but the shared hum universal human rights. This is not about sidelining domestic standards. On the contrary, it's about elevating global standards to ensure that not human rights are compromised in the name of international cooperation, in the name of mutual assistance. Our goal should be clear, a convention that not only acknowledge but actively champion strong human rights. Instead of using sovereignty as an argument to undermine human rights, a state should craft a convention that authorizes criminal investigations only for core cyber crimes as defined in the convention, while providing concrete and detailed human rights safeguards for both domestic and international cooperation. We would like to see human rights north not only referring in the preamble, but throughout all the chapters. And we would like to have well documented some, uh, and we would like to have a very narrow scope that is limited to such core cyber crimes. That's all for now. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you very me. much, Katica. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Tracy, your final comments? No, I'm going to cede my comments to you, Olga. Thank you all for coming. Um, okay. We are three minutes over. So, and Olga, final words to you. Okay, so thank you for the constructive dialogue. Share information, cooperate. Be active. I am always uh, positive towards technology. I trust human ingenuous and uh, human capacity. So the journey is the destination with this issue. So let's keep on talking, keep on interacting, keep on learning. And uh, I wish you enjoy the session. And thank you all very much. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you, the audience. And thank you, the remote participants. And thank you, the remote experts. Thank you all. <laughs>